Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friends, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning, this is Brackley, relaxing by the pool in Las Vegas. Today, we remember Bill Clagis on Light Talk. And this is Ellen coming to you from the tropical shores of St. Bart's. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk. And we are the Lumen Brothers and Sister. Well, welcome everyone to episode 380. Today, we have invited three designers who knew Bill Clagis to discuss his craft and career. Ellen, would you like to tell us a little bit about Bill and introduce our guests? Absolutely. Um, as most of you know, Bill Clagis was one of the leading uh, television lighting designers of all time. He passed away on Sunday, um, July 7th, 2024, at the age of 97. And were you to print out his list of credits, you'd find yourself with a document over six pages long, including award shows such as the Primetime Emmys, Tonys, Grammys, and Golden Globes, specials for such entertainment luminaries as Barbara Streisand, Bob Hope, Liza Minnelli, Bette Midler, Barry Manilow, and Mikhail Baryshnikov. Grand-scale special events such as the 1984 Summer Olympics Closing Ceremonies, Liberty Weekend, and inaugural galas for Presidents John F. Kennedy and George H.W. Bush. In all, his credits carry more than 300 events and shows amassed over a 58-year career that began at NBC in 19. 19- 48 in the days of live black and white television dramas and continued into the 21st century. Recently with work on the broadcast lighting facilities of Joel Austin's 6,000 seat Lakewood Church Sanctuary in Houston and the lighting for the George W. Bush Presidential Library in Dallas on the campus of SMU. Those credits garnered him seven primetime Emmy Awards for shows such as Dance in America, Barishnikov by Tharp, and the Kennedy Center Honors in 1984, and additional Emmy nominations. Bill Clagis was also the first and perhaps only lighting designer to be inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame. Quite the person and designer, to be sure. And our special guests today are, in alphabetical order, John Gresh, a recently retired senior vice president of Ari's Lighting Division in Los Angeles, who inspired his team with the motto, Bigger, Brighter, and Better. He enjoyed a long career in the motion picture and film industry and studied theatrical design and production at Carnegie Mellon University and lovingly stayed in touch with students from Carnegie over all these years. Jeff Ravitz is a primetime Emmy-winning lighting designer, lecturer, and writer, specializing in live entertainment, being captured for multi-camera television broadcasts and webcasts. He is co-author of Lighting for Televised Live Events and has also been the lighting designer for Bruce Springsteen for over 30 years, not to mention creative consultant for live designs, film and television masterclasses. And last, but certainly not least, is Dennis Size, Executive VP of Design at the Lighting Design Group, who was formerly with Disney ABC Television. His claim to fame is he has lit every president since Reagan, as well as NBC's Today Show, ABC's Good Morning America, various presidential conventions, and stars from Oprah Winfrey to Pope Francis Live at the Vatican. Welcome, Jeff, John, and Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And you haven't lived until you've seen Pope Francis do his little dance. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> well, you know, we are all obviously very saddened by the passing of Bill. We all knew him in various degrees. I remember meeting John and Jeff and Bill for lunch in Los Angeles uh, at Bill's favorite Italian restaurant, which I forget the name of, unfortunately. What was that called? Oh, Mary. There you go. And so I thought maybe we'd start with John and talk about, you know, talk about Bill a little bit as in terms of your professional relationship with him and also as a person. Like, how did it develop over the years? And you stayed very close right until recently. So let me start here. One of the things about the Carnegie Mellon alumni group is everybody helped everybody out and introduced them to people. And the person who brought me out to California straight from school for my final semester was Joe Tawil. And Joe Tawil was a very close friend of Bill Clages. So it didn't take long before I was introduced to Bill. 
In fact, Bill was made an honorary member of the Drama Alumni Association out in Los Angeles because of the way that he worked with everybody, not just Carnegie students, but it just was one of his connections. And then that was enhanced a few years later when he and another person who was a very close friend of mine and especially a close friend of Bill's and Joe's was George Stevie. And George, together with Bill, started the ASLD, which was an association before we had all the associations we have going on now that was vibrant, that anybody who was involved and interested in television lighting could get together, usually once every few months. It was a combination of a mini trade show sometimes, and most of the time it was just a breakfast discussion. And as busy as Bill was, he was always giving back in this particular venue as well. So that's when I first got to know him, because we went through a period when Joe Tawil and I were partners in Excalibur Industries. During that time, I was not selling lighting equipment. I was actually selling support equipment. But I got to know Bill even better because of the friendship and all the way that that was going on. And what I remember is Bill always had a strong opinion but he always was very approachable in terms of being able to talk to him. It wasn't like you felt, what am I doing in this room? Now, Jeff, you will remember there was one time in the very beginning, you'd remember this uh, you know, too, Ellen, when we did a television lighting workshop before LDI, and Bill and Jeff couldn't make it, and I was left with a few other people. And Bill called me up afterwards, and he said, this will never happen again. I'll be with you with every seminar we do in the future because I don't want somebody you know, imposing to be a lighting designer as an imposter. And so I don't have any lighting design credits professionally. So therefore, although I appreciate being uh, called here lighting designer, uh, Bill and I always had this kind of chuckle about that. As involved as I was, it was in the way of supplying what the designer needed. Um, and I would go so far as to say that Bill had the right mix of, quote, tooting his own horn and being kind of subservient to it. When you listed his credits, I in my mind, I heard Bill going, yada, 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 yada. You know, just like this was all every day to him. On the other hand, he probably edited better than anybody else what was said before it went online or when he had an article and he put it out there into a magazine, how it was going on. So he was very concise. He was very precise. And his engineering background, we haven't stated on that yet, his origin was as an engineer. And so his mind worked very technically in terms of how things would evolve. And I think everybody appreciated that. But yet he didn't make it only about the engineering. He goes so far sometimes to say in some of his quotes, he would say, if there's a purist listening to this article, please back off because we're only going so far with the technical details. So um, Jeff and Bill and I had the opportunity to uh, meet for lunch many times at his favorite restaurant, and usually we'd have a fourth who would join us like you did, uh, which was wonderful. And that continued just up until COVID. And then, of course, we didn't meet person, or we met on Zoom. So I just uh, really had the opportunity to get a lot of mentoring feedback, and uh, he had all sorts of commentary to do on different equipment. That that was never his, uh, his shortfall. But he was interested in learning more when he wasn't out in the field as much. And that's what was so special about the conversations that we had. It's interesting because I do believe he started at NBC as an engineer. Correct. And moved into lighting secondarily when they started one of those live playhouse yeah. things. And he said, he said in other interviews that his favorite thing was his first, those shows that were a breakthrough type. So certainly landing his first major show as a 90-minute live back in you know those early days um, – was a challenge, but also, you know, something that he really enjoyed learning on the job. He always said learning on the job was a big part of what he did. Because, you know, there were very few references that he could could work with. Well, John, was, wasn't Bill's degree actually in engineering? I believe that is correct. He, he didn't have, yeah. Uh, yeah. Electrical so, engineering. Yeah. And so uh, that's why and how he got involved first at NBC. And only then that he said, well, what I'm doing is kind of boring there. I think this lighting stuff could be really interesting as we break through into the next steps. And that's as I understand where the passion came in, is that is when he started to pick up the ball with that and make the best of it. And Bill's mantra was always simpler was better. Uh, you know, and so it's interesting for those of us who made a career out of selling gear, 
he was like, no, I only need three of these to do that. I don't need 30. You know, it's, he was kind of the master of figuring that out. But he was also, talk about precise, every time anybody interviewed him, if it was for a video, he walked in and relit the room. Yes, very true. Um, and in fact, he would probably kick me out of the human race if he saw what I did here just a few minutes ago to put this together. So. <laughs> you, you and me both, John. Yeah. But, uh, but it's kind of fun looking back out of what I did here in the construction part of my baseball right now. But, uh, but Bill's probably having a great chuckle, and he always was, right. uh, was that way. Um I got a little story. I don't know if you want to come back to this, but it might be good to do now. Just kind of the balance of Bill making sure that he held his position with still being very um, yeah, accessible. Uh, I asked him if he was coming to an LDI that was going to be in Vegas one year. This was after all the years we did uh, the seminars in Florida. And he said, well, I'm on the fence about it. And I said, I tell you what, if you come, I'll have a place at the airy booth at the table with your name on it and a chair with your name on it. And you can sit there. You always have a place to sit regardless of where you are to show. He, so he showed up. He came and he very much appreciated. And he had a lot of conversations. And after a while, he said, well, I'm going to go and see some other of my friends. And he got up and he took the nameplate with him. And everywhere he went, <laughs> he set the nameplate down and just kind of claimed the territory in the booth. And what was even better is at the end of the show, he took it home and he brought it to every other show I saw him come to when he would work the room. Is sit down. This space is reserved for Bill Clages. And I think it's a good That's balance right. of kind of how he made his entrance. Right. Hmm. So, Jeff, you come from a theatrical entertainment background and moved mm-hmm. into television lighting. Was Bill an influence or a mentor, or how did you get close to Bill? Well, he was definitely an influence and a mentor. Um, I remember in the early 80s, reading uh, a copy of Lighting Dimensions magazine, and there was a story about the Dorothy Hamill uh, ice show that he did that he won an Emmy for. And that was kind of a light bulb moment for me because um, not being in TV, um, I was like everyone else. The only Emmy awards I was familiar with was, you know, best actor, best actress, best show, et cetera, et cetera. I said, oh, my God, you can actually get an Emmy Award for lighting. And I thought about that, and I thought about what it must have taken for him to actually receive that award, and the article said that he had already won a couple of awards. Uh, so I I began to think about that, and of course, it the article described in detail exactly how he lit the show, and uh, I just kind of lapped it up. Um, a couple of years later, when when I had the opportunity to meet Bill, um, you know, I, you could tell you were in the aura of his confidence. He just knew so much about what he was doing, and he was absolutely confident that, you know, that, that he could pull off anything that was, that was given to him, and he would expound and explain um, un- until he was sure that you understood what he was talking about. So I kind of leaned on him as much as I could over the years. And um, I mean, to say that I was you know, a little bit intimidated by him is an understatement. I tried to hide it as best I could, but there was just something about being in his, you know, his presence uh, that, you know, that always made me tremble just a tiny bit. Uh, but over the years, as I worked on things, I would uh, call him, go over to the office, ask a couple of questions about uh, about what I was doing. And he was always so forthcoming. And um, as I, th- I, th- I think I mentioned recently, um, he actually did invite me into the Clages group uh, early on because they needed people that were well versed in concert lighting and he thought that he could kind of transfer the information that he had and the kind of the how to's of of the business pretty quickly to me and the timing just didn't work out and that was that but in the meantime we were always able to stay close and when i got really friendly with him over the years doing uh john's uh master class in orlando at ldi with him um and then just staying uh, in very close touch with him over the years. Uh, it was really a, a special relationship that we had. And didn't he have a long-term sort of uh, competitive relationship with the mayor of Fiorentino? Oh, it was uh, super competitive. 
I know that he was, you know, out there. And I mean, the impression that I got, and correct me if uh, if I'm wrong here, because this is all hearsay, um, and um, and you know, stories that I heard, you know, from Bill and and others, that um, he didn't like the way Emmy was was you know running things and um and in, trying to influence his lighting and when he went off on his own they became you know sort of arch competitors um you know east coast versus west coast and you know one show versus another but he was part of the company in new york right uh, jeff for several years oh yeah yeah i mean that, that was, that's how i met bill that was his first freelance you know his entry into the freelance world when he left the uh uh, the studio NBC. Yeah. Yeah. He was at Emmy Farantino's for, I want to say about 13 years, if I understand yeah, it. Was the a time. Yeah. And so we don't want to underestimate that run. And then he started the Clages group, as I understand it, for uh, about 12 years. And then the new Clages group for the last 25. That was in the mid, mid 80s, John. Mid 80s, he started Correct. Uh, in California. Correct. Yeah. And so uh, if you, figure that the date that we were given for leaving NBC, I think, was 1970, and uh, that took him about 83 to start uh, the Clages Group, if I'm remembering that correctly. And, and so I, I think I met him uh, probably even before he started the Clages Group, as I said, for the, the reasons I did. And I, I happen to have a bit of insight because Emmy Farantino was a Carnegie Mellon graduate, so he was very active with the Carnegie Mellon group, even coming to do classes at school like you have done. Dennis before and Bill has done it before and Jeff's very active. So, you know, there's sometimes you end up very close to each other, even though you're in a very competitive situation. You make it work for the students. You make it work for what's going on. You know, it's interesting. Uh, when he was uh, living in Los Angeles, uh, Pat McKay, who is the founder of LDI and the publisher of Lighting Dimensions, um, we had had him as a speaker on your master classes and a lot of different stuff. And then we wanted to do, uh, Jeff and I were out to dinner one night with a group of people and somebody said, oh my God, we should do film and television lighting master classes like we do uh, the Broadway lighting master classes with Jules and Peggy. And of course, uh, Jeff agreed right there on the spot to be the creative <laughs> consultant for it. And then Pat and I went to see Bill, and he was living in the most extraordinary house in Hollywood Hills, sort of right under the Hollywood sign. Does anybody remember that house that had been an art museum originally? And yeah. one wall was like glass, and you could see right out over L.A. to Catalina. It was extraordinary. Um and that really sort of influenced Pat when she went to L.A. to look for a house in the Hollywood Hills with a phenomenal view and a glass wall, which she has. But <laughs> yeah. then he moved to a high rise in Santa Monica, which is the last place I remember visiting him. Yeah, that's where he spent the rest of his life. And keep in mind, he was very happy that he had a view of the ocean from every room in his high rise, um, you know, uh, yeah. uh, call condo. Yeah, it was right on the water. Yeah. That was phenomenal, yeah. that place. So, Dennis, when did you meet Bill? I met Bill in the mid-70s. I was in college and uh, in Pennsylvania and uh, 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 trying to decide what I wanted to do when I grew up. And then I, I made this commitment to uh, uh, theater and, and design. But the university that I was at didn't have a theater program. They had a television program in the communications department. So I kind of went in that route. And then I had an internship at a PBS affiliate there, and I really got jazzed by television lighting. I said, you know, maybe this is really what I want to do. But in an effort to learn more, and at that time, there wasn't a lot of publications. I mean, it was theater crafts, and uh, uh, they would occasionally have articles and stuff. But I started looking around and asking around for where I could learn more. And at that time, that's how I, I knew uh, Ferentino Associates and, and Bill's uh, Association, because they would routinely do master classes back then. So I signed up for a master class. I was probably, I don't know, 19, 20. And uh, it was in New York. And I drove off to New York to uh, attend this class that was held by uh, uh, a couple of the Ferentino guys. It was like Dave Clark and E. Carlton Winkler and, and the uh, extremely memorable Bill Clagis. Um, couldn't tell you what I learned at the class. Uh, there were some funny things. There were some moments, but as a teenager who was going into this, I was astonished by how, um, how much time 
Mr. Clay just spent with this kid from Pennsylvania talking about what he did and how television works and how lighting works. And, and he was so giving and was such an incredible mentor. I mean, by that point in my life, I've had a lot of teachers between grade school, high school, college. He was the most incredible teacher I ever encountered in my life and, and was so totally giving. Uh, it, it, it just made such an impression on me. Uh, as a matter of fact, cut to the chase years later, I started working at ABC in 1979, and they were doing a, a master class on sitcoms, uh, uh, soap operas, and uh, s- something else. But uh, it, it was through the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. And I wanted to go and see this thing. And I had just started working at ABC. I was doing soap operas. I was probably in TV for six months. And I called Bill and I said, hey, I'd love to attend this, this workshop that you're doing, but I can't get a ticket. It's, it's a full house. And he said, no problem. You're doing soap operas. Come and sit on the panel. And I was like, uh, huh? <laughs> you know, it, th- th- this was an incredible panel of experts. And I'm just a, a 26-year-old kid wet behind the ears. And all of a sudden, I'm on the panel with them and, and just saying whatever I could have said for doing it as quickly as I did. But he was so giving and so generous, and he always made you feel comfortable and and part of whatever he was doing. You know, uh, people talk about what a great mentor he was, but Bill could, if you wanted to be a lighting designer, Bill could turn a banana into a lighting designer. I mean, the, the words of wisdom and the advice and how he could cut to the chase and simplify everything you need to know was just incredible. I remember many years later, we would always encounter each other at, at events. Bill uh, 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 did many, maybe six, seven, eight of the Republican National Conventions, which was his thing. And uh, it was usually Bobby Dickinson who did the Democratic. And being at uh, a network, I was always sent to do the network uh, 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 studios. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's just by pure coincidence, I'm doing that right now in Milwaukee for ABC. And uh, I was commiserating with uh, David Grill, who uh, worked uh, with Bill extensively on the RNC for years. And I'm saying, Jesus, it's just so coincidental that here I'm at the RNC. We're talking about Bill. And uh, uh, the, at, at those events, I would usually hook up with Bill. We'd go out for lunch. We'd talk. We'd chat. We'd learn. And, and uh, uh, it was always funny to me how he'd say, well, you tell me what you're doing or you tell me. Uh, what you feel, because he always wanted an interchange. It was never, this is the way you got to do it, kid. It was always, let's talk about how we do it as a collaborative process, and not just among other lighting designers, but among the design team. Everybody was that was involved with the show was part of the team. And, and uh, I remember, God, it made it probably in the late 80s, early 90s, when the big move was to high-definition television. And uh, everybody was saying, oh, the lighting's got to change. It's going to be so different. It's, you're going to have to do a lot of different things and new lights and new this and blah, 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 blah. And I, and I said, okay, I'm calling uh, the God of lighting and he will give me the advice that I need. So I called Bill and I said, Bill, high definition television, you're doing that. You're lighting it. What do I need to do? I'm told it's going to be very different. <laughs> And he just, you know, chuckled and did what Bill does when he was talking to people. So he, you never felt you were being talked down to. But he said, Dennis, a top light is always a top light. A front light is always a front light. A backlight is always a backlight. A side light is always a side light. And on and on. There will be no difference. Just the lights, the intensity, you know, the obvious technical things. But he never stressed that. He always... Uh, he always wanted you to understand the design aesthetic, the artistic sensibility behind it. And uh, it, it, that was the kind of relationship I had with him. He was on the West Coast and I was on the East Coast. And we would, we would connect and have lunch at, at some event that we might have been at together. But I, I, I was always very jealous of uh, my friend Jeff Rabbit having, having the god of lighting in his backyard <laughs> all the time. <laughs> you know, let's face it. Uh, depending on what religious beliefs you have. Uh, and I think I actually said this on Light Talk on one of the shows. 
when God said, let there be light, Bill Clay just said, and what intensity would you like it at, sir? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great but, line. But he influenced so, so many of us. And, and you know, uh, with his engineering degree, and I'm telling you, as John said, you could sit down and talk uh, uh, toys and, and uh, uh, fixtures, instrumentation with him, and, and he, he was a genius when it came to the technology. But at the same time, he's one of the few people I, I knew where the left brain and the right brain had some kind of a magical connection, and, and he could cross between the technology and the design sensibility. Yeah, I'd love to know more about his upbringing, too, because you know he went into engineering school, but he obviously had an eye for art and, and film and uh, the, you know, the aesthetic chops to marry the two sides of so the science and art. And, you know, how unusual is that? Um, Very, you know, especially I, when he was a child. I mean, I don't know yeah. anything about his childhood, but wow. What an upbringing and what a transition into whatever it is that we do now. Yeah. At a time where, let's face it, those, those lighting designers were coming out of the radio theater studios and then transitioning into television. I agree. And there's not, there's not a... Uh, 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 an incredibly fabulous, wonderful, great show from the golden age of television that, that Bill probably didn't have his hands on. And even in those early days, I mean, uh, you know, Emmy was, Emmy was the guy at ABC and uh, uh, Bill was the guy at NBC and, and uh, uh, Red and a few of the other guys, but uh, they formed a, a a company that was astonishingly over the top in terms of talent. Yeah, John, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say it's interesting that Bill didn't talk about his childhood much that I can remember. I was just going to uh, you know punctuate what you said. Jeff, you know, feels the same way. Uh, most of it was always talking about his uh, engineer degree and then the NBC days uh, as the beginning of his story. And it could just be because he wanted to fill the conversation with things he thought was most relative to what was going on. I know that he went off into the opera. I mean, he certainly, I don't know if he went because he loved opera, his wife did, but whichever it was, um, you know, he always would talk about the, uh, the Met prior to the Lincoln Center Met. And we talked about that experience quite a bit and how there was crossover between what he would see there sometimes that he might consider in his look. In fact, he... He's documented that he never thought of what he did as creative or artistic in the sense of the way that somebody might launch a painting. Uh, he always thought that he developed a bag of tricks combined with history of method. And he tried things along the way, and he basically brought it all together. And he did it in such a way that everybody trusted him, that he knew what he was doing. Now, the fact that the end result sometimes came out uh, quite good, he just never thought of himself, and he's put this in print, as a artistic person. He thought of himself as being able to package, if you will, what was needed for lighting for that show with great results. He, he didn't understate his results. He just said where it came from, that the, the creative element was pretty much already determined, and he was uh, facilitating Bill also talked, this is a little bit off the trend right here at the moment. He says, everybody would always ask, you know, how is it working with such and such a star? How is it being next to all of these people? And with very few exceptions, he would say, I was too busy to really pay attention about them and who they were and what they were about. I was all trying to just get the, the shot and the show up and keep it on a very uh, tight schedule. He always pried, as I said earlier, he was very, very um, intent and in trying to keep it efficient. Uh, there's a few exceptions that he made a lot of commentary with, but they were very, very few and far between, and they're well documented. But but the other thing, too, other than his own skills and, and abilities, uh, he had a way with people that, as designers who work in the, in the professional arena that we're in, it's always very difficult to deal with the personalities, especially when it comes to some of the celebrities and, and the high-profile producers and directors that could just destroy you with, with uh, a wave of their hand. And Bill had a way of working and dealing with the, with these people that it, it, uh, 
he, he managed to assuage fears, calm people, project an air of confidence, and, and in the worst of possible times, make people feel that everything will be just fine. Yeah. And, and that's a gift. That's a real gift. Even when he was doing classes, I remember years ago, uh, Sonny Sonnenfeld was having master classes, uh, uh, and uh, Bill and I did uh, a joint thing where I was basically doing a soap opera scene. We put up a set, we did some stuff, and uh, uh, Bill was doing news, uh, showing how news sets are lit. And then he did a retrospect of his life. And it was for maybe, I don't know, 75 students in a, in a studio in New York, or maybe 100. And uh, they were just in awe, just in awe of, the, of this man speaking and you know, let's face it, he had the most incredible stories. Man, so uh, uh, it, it, he had that audience in the palm of his hand. And it's uh, it always fascinated me the way he could do that because you didn't think of him as this guy, this charismatic person, but he really was. Yes. And, and uh, um, it's just, uh, I was always envious of that ability that he had and, and, and admired that so deeply. So uh, one thing that, uh, Ellen, you know, Jeff knows, I don't know, if Dennis, if you've ever gone to the show light uh, gathering that happens every four years, except for when uh, COVID took place. And Bill was always uh, uh, very excited to go over to Europe and attend that show and be part of, be a presenter most of the time and deliver paper and such. And uh, we would have various discussions, especially when Jeff and I would get together with him about the influence of people on the other side of the pond. Uh, not just what was taking place in America. Yeah, well, he was the one who really talked me into going over there and uh, and uh, attending one of those shows. And he ended up doing a presentation there. Um, <laughs> he had everyone in stitches. And of course, he had this uh, deluxe PowerPoint presentation that went along with it. Uh, but he, he said that he overheard some people uh, in the lobby talking about, uh, did you catch the comedian? <laughs> uh, because every other, <laughs> I mean, he was telling incredible stories, but they all ended with a punchline. Yeah, that's very true. It, that's a good stuff. You know, Jeff, it's just uh, incredible that we had the number of lunches together with Bill, many times just the three of us. And it always uh, would start after the initial greeting. So he would ask me what was, you know, new from the equipment side and from the business side. And after about 15 minutes, he said, OK, that's enough of that. And then he'd all of a sudden start asking you about what shows you're on. And we'd really get into the fun stuff of you describing what you were doing. And Bill asked questions. And would almost like you would do if you were going to give your thesis project to a group of people at college that was, was doing it. And he was very supportive. But at the same time, he had his opinions. And I know one of the opinions he had was in the beginning of LED. He said, they're not ready for television yet. That was his big commentary when many of the manufacturers were coming out with LG pictures and he was a big fan of not converting too early in the, uh, in the cycle. But you may have some more uh, insight into some of those commentaries that he made specifically for your work. He took the time to do a power and cost calculation of what you would save using LEDs and how little you would really save. <laughs> and somehow he managed to you know, create a spreadsheet that, that laid it all out. It's interesting because just at this sort of, you know, conjuncture of his passing, I think Dennis will tell us that LEDs are king. And uh, ETC published some information yesterday that they're discontinuing their tungsten line. So it really is uh, a big uh, transition right now. Absolutely. But it's been in transition for at least 20 years. And Bill certainly was correct that you want to make sure from a design standpoint and from a designer standpoint, what the trade-offs were, and all of the technology that has gone in since to address that is, is amazing. I wouldn't for a minute uh, understate the work that has gone into the LED technology, but I can think of many cases where people waited an extra step, and then they had problems with management, who, of course, is this LED? And you say, oh, well, get rid of that person, or go to, you know, we're going to be moving on. So there was a lot of, uh, and I know, Jeff, you and Dennis deal with this all the time. There's a lot of things where maybe the artistic cycle of using it and the people comfortable with it was out of sync with somebody making a management decision that we're going to go ahead and do this new studio with this technology or this particular fixture. 
And that's what Bill was concerned about was not preserving, but just making sure that people were using the proper perspective of getting a good image on their uh, on their screen. Maybe that was his riddle. When is a key light not a key light? When it's an LED. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could be. And I think he was just waiting for the quality to come up to his standards. Yeah, no, exactly. The, the, and he would show him engineering why it wasn't there, and he would talk about the interface. We should really mention that he was very knowledgeable about camera technology. So he would say, this is why this is not quite time for this. And uh, having come from a company who was very focused on camera technology he was always mentioning that to me that that is and he, he mentioned it even in the article that came out by the television academy at the time he got his honorary uh you know uh membership hall of fame uh was the fact that you know this was a really important point that he thought is is the designer actually getting what's needed at this point in time on uh, on the screen and, uh, you know, I think there was a, a lot that was said about that. We should mention a bit more. To this day, to my knowledge, there still is not another lighting designer in the Television Academy Hall of Fame. There is a director of photography, but even that was just recent. And there's very few what people would say below the line people that have been brought in. Um, they exist. Uh, there's costume designers and, of course, uh, many other uh, support designers from the production side. But it's quite something. I didn't realize that. I thought uh, I thought Emmy was in the Hall of Fame also. Not not on the roster, and and I've checked it, but uh, a couple of times uh, we would laugh when I'd go over there. I'd take my picture next to the bust that's outside. Most everybody who I I can't say for sure everybody has a bust or a plaque or whatever outside of themselves. But uh, Bill tells the story that they got to call on the uh, sculpture that's going to make a bust of you. Okay. Comes on over, does this whole thing that he's going to do. And when it was all done, it was given to the uh, Television Academy. But the catch always was, is they expected that the uh, person was going to buy one for themselves. And Bill told the person, what do I need to bust of myself in my house to look at? I don't I don't need that. And so the, the artist, with, with the sculpture was pretty upset, the fact that he didn't get a, a sale, if you will, of one. But, of course, the Television Academy got the other. So that may be part of the reason why... Um, it is actually um, uh, placed uh, in the back of the lineup, if you will. Yeah, uh, it, you you go to see his, and he's kind of placed back where somebody would come across as not being the biggest contributor, you know. So, uh, but he got a good chuckle out of that each time. Well, there you go. That's why they don't let lighting designers into the academy. They don't buy a bus. I of think themselves. I think there's <laughs> yeah. something to be said. They'd rather they'd, they'd rather buy a round of beer for everybody at the Circle Bar than have a bus to themselves. That's probably true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know the actors all buy the bust. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, sure they do. There's some great yeah. artistic ones, and if you haven't seen it, it's worth going to North Hollywood to see, especially the ones that are done of uh, those performers like Jackie Gleason with his, you know, wonderful look and so forth. It's 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 a whole figurine. It's quite wonderful. But anyway, uh, but but Bill really is in a class of himself, even with all of the other wonderful people we have in life design. Uh, nobody else has quite made that uh, that happen for themselves. I don't know where he ever found the time to do as many things as as he accomplished. It's 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 really remarkable, and he never stopped. You know, and and, and he was always, as I said earlier, he was an incredible mentor to so many people. But he always took the time to provide advice, and, and if people called him for information, he was always willing to give it. It, it's the just only thing remarkable. I can think of is he mastered the efficiency we were talking about that he talked in all of his shows and designs, simpler was better. And somehow between his engineering mind and his organizational skills, he just was able to be so time efficient. And uh, you could see that when we would have our lunch discussion. You know, like I said, it would be, you know, like a finite first 10 minutes or something. Okay, that's enough of that side of the business. Let's, you know, and not even the business, that's move the side on. of our <laughs> conversation. Let's move on. And I appreciated that, you know, the, the, the metronome was going. Yeah. So you asked me when I first met Bill, and I told him about this this story. When I was 10 or 11, um, I had a cousin who was uh, an adult uh, age cousin that worked for NBC. 
and he took me and my dad to see the Perry Como show. Perry Como had a weekly variety series with singers and dancers and so forth. And, uh, you know, Perry Como was a, a big deal star in those days. So we're sitting there watching a rehearsal. And I see a guy up on stage and he's got a meter and I really didn't know what it was, but he was staring at lights and calling out some some orders and um, and then goes out into the audience and sits next to Perry. Well, my cousin says, here, I want to introduce you to Perry. Perry says, well, I'm talking to the lighting director. So um, he said, but OK, bring him over. So I met Perry. I got an autograph. Sitting next to him was Bill Clages. And I only know that because the timing worked out. I asked Bill if he was working on the show in those days, and he was. And so there he was. I was 11 years old. Very good. <laughs> Boy, what, you that's were, a great what story. What goes around comes around. That's right. a wonderful story. That's a great story. But, but Dennis, what it really is yeah. is just how young Jeff was when he was focused on this type of thing. I mean, 11 is pretty young to be uh, aware of that. That's true. Well, Je Jeff is just a kid. Weren't you at his 40th birthday last year? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that lighting. I mean, man, he's made himself. I'm jealous. Yeah, no. I look like I'm older than Bill was. Well, you know, the fact we talked about how he had a sharp mind. Um, you know, last few years of Jeff, you talked to him more recently than I had. Uh, you know, physically, he wasn't getting out. He wasn't able to uh, or didn't want to, whatever it was, get out and about. But it's pretty incredible that somebody probably kept going, what would you say, to within a couple of years ago, really? Oh, truly, yeah. truly. Um, yeah. Avidly, you know, involved in continuing to learn and, and uh, you know, mentor people. It's really only been the last couple of years, especially since COVID, that he was sort of shut in and a little, um, and, you know, a lot of his closest friends started to pass away. I think he wanted to outlive Sonny Sonnefeld. I think that was part of what he wanted to do. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that yeah, he did. Kidding. That he did. Yeah. I yeah. think that was the goal. No, he and Sonny were great friends, well, as we know, and uh, they spent a lot of time. Uh, both of them, just like I had talked about, he and other people like George Devi and such. But he and Sonny uh, certainly did the type of seminars in other locations, and that was one that was at Carnegie Mellon too. I remember I went back to support them and it was bill and sonny and myself uh with uh, cindy's classes back then that was loads of fun and then they were such good friends that at uh you, you, i know that jeff you'll remember it so i don't know if you were there dennis but uh design partners who he sold the clay group to held an evening for him if you remember and a lot of people came up it was a very kind i missed that okay i heard about it. that was a great event but but sunny gets up on the stage and in sunny style there was no self-editing whatsoever and it's going on <laughs> and bill finally said okay that's enough of that sunny and he just kind of took the hook i took him right off the stage <laughs> and everybody kind of like no but bill could do that you know it was just kind of the rapport he he had with all these people as much love as there was between them enough was enough and, uh, but that was a that was a great evening, as was the you know television academy evening too. Both of which I will always be top of the list of things I had a chance to witness. So that that evening was called you know uh, fifty years of Bill Clay. Okay, thank you. And I remember asking him uh, uh, as I was leaving. I said, "This doesn't mean you're retiring." He said, "Never retire." <laughs> And he lived, he lived for that. Oh. Of course, on the same hand, he did give me an attaboy for saying I was retiring from what I was doing. I told Bill, I'm not retiring from life. I'm just retiring from the, the job I had. And uh, he said, well, that's okay. But uh, it was interesting. He did uh, uh, see a, a good, uh, the goodness in when it's time to retire from certain things you would. Well, he certainly went through decade after decade of incredible productions and major advances in technology. I remember at one of the master classes at USC, John, you had lent us a camera. Its name was like, I don't know, something Alexa, Adela. Yeah, I don't you're know, correct. That no, no, was you were called. right the first time, yeah. <laughs> Alexa. And uh, it was up on a platform in the center of the room. And uh, I think Jeff and Bill at one point came over and were sort of looking at it. And Bill was asking a lot of questions. And he definitely was curious about every aspect of, of production. Yeah. And even when well, he had started, I think, in the maintenance department correct. at NBC. That was his first job. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, he, he's the one that introduced me to the term Plumicon tube camera. 
Have you ever even <laughs> heard anybody else use that phrase? No. I have. Yeah, but we but should point out that the maintenance department in a television network deals with the engineering and the guts of the cameras and the racks. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't the janitor. Yes, that's true. Right. 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 Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So he knew the cameras from inside out. Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. He was a genius. To your point, Chef, I've heard that other people say it, but Bill was the only one who could spell it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he was a little like uh, Maggie Smith and Downton Abbey, you know. He, says, yeah. he used to say one time, I'm not arguing, I'm only explaining. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, he had no problem saying when he didn't like something or if he didn't agree with it, uh, but without, uh, you might say, downplaying the person just about what the right. actual result was right. which was quite magic but the converse of that as i mentioned was you know if he was in the room and other people came up he was very inclusive in that regard uh you might have to wait a moment but he was very inclusive brackley steve any questions comments well i i only wish i could have met bill he seemed this has been a wonderful conversation today learning more about him this morning i was doing some research and i went to the academy um site and they had a whole in-depth interview with him nine-part interview and it was interesting at the end the interviewer said so what would you want to be remembered as or by and he says i want to be remembered as a professional quality practitioner of lighting design and that's so i think tells him who he is and who he was. So I think it's been, well, it's been great. Well, it sounds like, I was trying to think about what his legacy is, and it sounds like his legacy is he was a good man. Bingo. He was just a good person. Yeah. You nailed it, Steve. He really was. We need more of those. Yeah. Yes. And it, as John just said, you know, <laughs> Bill certainly had opinions about things. But it, it was never it was never done in a mean way. He did tell a very funny story once at one of the master classes. Somebody said, "Well, you worked with Immy for all those years. Did you learn anything from him?" And he said, "Yes, I learned a very very important piece of information from him. When you go to an event and there's a coat rack and there's a million beige." raincoats make sure you button yours crookedly so you'll know which one it is when it's time to leave <laughs> that is wonderful ellen that's great wow that says it all i'd like to share this one with you because it's one that's lived with me ever since my my right after my college days and that was uh, bill would talk about people you know doing the load in and say mr clages where would you like the lights and he would say put them where the cord will reach the outlet and it was just such a basis <laughs> of some of your setups of just be practical about the situation, you know, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll work it from there. But it was just, he, had, he was full of these kinds of things with just simpler was, was better and, and, and all these things that were very practical. And I love that coach story you just mentioned. Well, Ellen, it looks like uh, we need to wrap up a little bit. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you to all three of you guys. It was just extraordinary listening to your reminiscences about Bill, who really was an important figure in uh, everyone's lives. You know, all of us and all of his students and all the people he worked with, I know he had a huge impact on everyone. So he will be missed, as Jeff said, and I can uh, send you all to our website, you know, um, LiveDesignOnline.com. Jeff wrote a lovely piece in, in memory of Bill, uh, which we posted, and um, I thank you it, for that. It was lovely. I read that. Nicely done. Nicely said, Jeff. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Well, the rocking sound of the luminoids tell us that once again you spend another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast that way. You will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoop Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers. And sister. Coming to you from Las Vegas, St. Farts, the Lone Star State, and all over the United States. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. 
We'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. So long, all. <laughs>